I now formally start this webinar by introducing the speakers. The keynote speaker, Professor Laila Abu Lukhod, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, ma'am, uh, is the Joseph L. Buttonweiser Professor of Social Science Department in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University. She has extensively worked on dynamics of women's and human rights, global liberalism, and feminist governance of the Muslim world. She has also coined the term secure feminism for mainstreaming gender and installing women in leadership position, the expanding field of counterterrorism and emphasize the feminist governance not to contribute to the framing of communities and religious groups by erasing the agency of diverse women, political histories, and the context of contemporary gender violence. She has highlighted the dangerous collusion from the international women's rights advocates and global security enterprises called countering violent extremists. Moreover, she has worked on politics of knowledge and representation, the dynamics of women's and human rights, question of representation and ethics, cultural politics of media and museums, politics of memory, and the international circulation of rights discourse. She has published significant work on Wales sentiments, honor and poetry in a Bodian society, writing women's world, remaking women, drama of nationhood, local context of Islamism in popular media, and two Muslim women need saving and other edited volumes. The next speaker is Dr. Dina Manas Siddiqui, who teaches at the Faculty of Liberal Studies, New York University. Her research grounded in the study of Bangladesh, development studies, transnational feminist theory, and the anthropology of Islam and human rights. She has published extensively on the global garment industry, non-state gender justice systems, and the cultural politics of Islam and nationalism in Bangladesh. She is currently engaged in a project on economic development and discourses of empowerment and the travels of civilizational feminisms. Dr. Siddiqui is a member of the New York University Society of Fellows on the Advisory Board of Dialectical Anthropology and on the Editorial Board of Routledge Women in Asia publication series. She's on the Executive Committee of the American Institute of Bangladesh Studies and an Advisory Council member of the South Asian Feminist Network Sangha. The third speaker of the session, Dr. Shanila Khoja Mulji, is the Associate Professor of Muslim Societies at Georgetown University. She researches and writes about the interplay of gender, race, religion, and power in transnational contexts. And she explores this theme particularly in the relation to Muslim population in South Asia and in the North American diaspora. Dr. Koja Mulji, book Forging the Ideal Educated Girl, the production of desirable subjects in Muslim South Asia was awarded the 2019 Jackie Kirk Outstanding Book Award and the 2019 Michael Harrington Award. Her second book, Sovereign Attachments, Masculinity, Muslimness, and Affective Politics in Pakistan, won the 2022 Best Book Award from the International Studies Association's Theory section, the 2022 Book Award from the Association for Middle East Women's Studies. The session is moderated by Professor Maitri Chaudhary, who taught at the Center for the Study of Social System, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. And she was the director of the Women's Studies program between 2006 and 2008. Her central work has been on the changing contours of feminism, media, and academia. Since the early 90s, she has been looking at the changing nature of public discourse in the context of both neoliberalism and the rise of majoritarianism. Her publications include The Women's Movement in India, Reform and Revival, Feminism in India, the Practice of Sociology, Sociology in India, Intellectual and Institutional Trends, Refashioning India, Gender, Media and the Public Discourse and Doing Theory. Her recent works have looked at the making of public discourse in contemporary India. <laughs> to further create the connect between academic scholarship and wider public, she, along with her colleagues, run a website on sociology for accessible but informed discussions, doingsociology.org. She also regularly lectures on YouTube to bridge the gap between academic knowledge and public discourse. We welcome all of you. And now, I know I've taken a lot of time, so I'll quickly hand over the session to the moderator, Professor Maitri Chaudhary. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sanjana. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Center of, for Studies of Plural Societies for organizing this webinar, The Cunning of Gender Violence, and having this incredible panel of scholars. Thank you, Dr. Shiva 
webinars for all the efforts that you have go, uh, gone to in making uh, uh, you know, a webinar of this kind possible. I'm honored to be here today's discussion where Professor Laila Abulawood will give the keynote address. This will be followed by Dr. Dina Siddiqui and then Dr. Shanila Koda Mulji's presentations. They have been involved for some time now in a collaborative project, The Cunning of Gender Violence, Geopolitics and Feminism, which is going to culminate in a 2023 book to be published by Duke University. We academic activists and the larger public eagerly look forward to its publication. For we live in a world which is no longer marked by the invisibility of gender that my generation witnessed 50 years ago, but by a hyper visibility of gender and its cunning deployment by different apparatuses of power, global and national, that have created a new hegemonic consensus, a global framing of gender violence. The speakers are looking forward to an engaged discussion and would therefore keep their presentations brief about 15 minutes each. I hope that's all right with all the speakers. And the discussion would then be open only after all three speakers complete their presentations. I do not wish to stand between Professor Laila Abu Logod and a very eager audience. So it's over to you, Professor Laila. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, thank you so much. We were so we're so honored uh, to have been invited to this uh, incredible center and the gender project. Uh, and I'm so excited to be uh, joining you in India for this webinar. Um, and we look forward um, to talking with you about this collective project that was just mentioned that um, my two colleagues here have been involved with. Uh, for many years, and it's, we think, one of the most important and thorny issues within feminist theory and activism, question of gender violence. And what we're going to do very briefly, we hope, uh, is to share some of the thinking that we've done for a book that uh, will be um, published by Duke University Press this summer uh, called The Cunning of Gender Violence, Geopolitics and Feminism, as you just heard. And uh, you might be interested to know that it, it will appear in a series uh, called Next Wave, New Directions in Women's Studies that's co-edited by Professor Indrapal Gruel, who uh, couldn't be here. And my co-editors uh, are um, uh, Professor Rima Hamami, who uh, I understand was just met, um, from Birze University in Palestine, and Professor Nadira Shelhub Kavorkian from Jerusalem. And we began, neither of whom is here, but we thought you would love to hear from uh, Dina and Shanila. And we began pulling this um, project uh, together through Columbia University's Center for the Study of Social Difference with um, generous support from the Henry Luce Foundation, which had an in initiative that was called Religion and International Affairs. So you can see the connection here. And we did this because we were worried about why feminism had seemed to gain so much success over the past decades in global institutions. And as scholars, as ethnographers, as practitioners, as activists who focused on the everyday lives of people and the politics of gender, religion, and colonial or imperial violence, especially in the Middle East and South Asia, uh, and also actually where Muslim immigrants from these regions now live in the West, we were troubled. Uh, we were troubled by the particular ways some feminist visions and selective framings of gender violence were being codified in state and foreign policies and in international development and both military and humanitarian interventions. Um, so I'm sure you all know better than we do, that at the turn of the 21st century, international support for women's rights coalesced around the figure of the oppressed Muslim woman. Uh, this was what drove me to write my book, Do Muslim Women Need Saving, a book that has generated uh, both interest and controversy. Uh, and I'm honored that it's been translated into multiple languages, including I discovered when I came to Delhi a few years ago into Malalayam in Kerala. 
but throughout the disastrous 20 year military occupation of Afghanistan, cultural and religious violence against women was used to justify the continuing presence of US troops on the ground, while representations of gendered violence fueled Islamophobia at home and abroad. And the harnessing of a feminist agenda to legitimize violent military intervention in the name of protecting women against violence seemed then, 2001, a kind of exceptional instance of political instrumentalization, but we've continued to see religion and especially Islam invoked as a diagnosis of gender-based violence, uh, GBV, and violence against women, vow, and the agenda to combat these ills has in fact become more and more central to global security and governance. And we wanted to figure out how this had happened and with what consequences, especially for people in different places. And over the course of our collaborative work, we emerged with this new concept called GBVOW, capital G B V A W, and we use this acronym to refer to the institutionalized apparatus and agenda that legal scholars like, uh, I don't know if you know her work uh, in the US, uh, like Janet Halley and her colleagues have called governance feminism. And we distinguish GBVOW, this capital letter thing from small g, gender violence, which we take very seriously and I'll come back to that. Uh, but we think there are alternative ways to understand that violence, uh, which I'll talk about. And I'm not gonna talk about my work on securo feminism. I really wanna talk about the overall project. Um, so what happened was we brought together an interdisciplinary collective of feminist scholars with deep regional knowledges and with critical perspectives on imperial politics. And we wanted to think together about the implications of the successes feminists who walked the halls of power in the global north, really, uh, but elsewhere had garnered over the past few decades in what seemed to be the mainstreaming of a feminist agenda. So how does the agenda to combat gender violence play itself out in cases brought to the International Criminal Court or in humanitarian interventions in Gaza? How has Hindu nationalism in India fueled gendered violence How's the international campaign against child marriage as violence displaced, dis, how has it displaced other women's issues in Bangladesh and how might it be connected to the need for girls in factory labor? That's what Professor Siddiqui will be talking about. Why are some feminists and feminist organizations clamoring for inclusion uh, in campaigns to counter violent extremism, that kind of undefined, undefinable phantom that turns out to be just a way to vilify or criminalize Muslim men? Why do some feminists turn to the state when the state itself might be a source of violence for women? And that's what Professor Khoja Mulji will be talking about uh, in a case in Pakistan. So we wanted to look at how prevailing assumptions and, and technologies might be affirming or sustaining dominant rationales of power. And we were seeing these efforts at work in border control, exclusions, legitimation of state violence, in securitizing regimes of surveillance, and by focusing on the Middle East and South Asia and communities in the West who come from these places, we couldn't avoid noticing the ways that religion and racialized ethnicity, particularly we call the Muslim question, ran so deeply through the international governance structures and framing representations of gender-based violence and violence against women. And so um, we emerged from this project with three strategies for rethinking the relation between multiple forms and experiences of gender violence, small g, and the problematic racialized codification of the international feminist agenda to combat violence. And as I said, um, first, you know, we distinguish small g gender violence from what we call GBVAL, the institutionalized agenda and global apparatuses, including legal for addressing violence. Uh, second, we ended up finding the Hegelian concept of cunning productive in capturing the ways a kind of well-meaning and even visionary 
feminist commitment to end or address all forms of gender violence got folded in to world affairs. And that's why we titled the book as we did. Um, and lastly, we ended up parsing the interconnected circuits of power along which GBV, GB Val travels. Um, and I'll talk just a little bit about that. And we trace the silences and omissions of the categories and activists who view the uptake of violence against women and gender-based violence into global governance as a feminist victory, they regularly admit their concerns about the dynamics of racialization and Islamophobia that seem at play, but they downplay it. They downplay these as a kind of uncomfortable baggage that burdens or hijacks uh, the good work of combating gendered violence. And we came to a slightly different conclusion and we argue in different ways that these dynamics may not be external to the ways the GBVAO agenda works, but in fact may be integral to whatever success this feminist agenda has had over the past decade. And that's what we mean by the cunning of gender violence. And we came to see that the political framing and fusing of violence against women and later gender-based violence as governance categories um, that are part of, uh, we came to see them as governance categories that are part of a powerful normative agenda within institutions of global governance. And so, you know, you think about the way bodily integrity are, are addressed now by the Secu by Security Council resolutions at the UN, they're raised in the International Criminal Court in Hague as in sexual violence in war. They're integrated into global development imperatives. They're made a central concern in context of humanitarian intervention. And they're encoded in protocols and conventions at the core of the global refugee regimes. Uh, they're recurrently invoked as a global security issue connected to violent extremism, uh, as I talk about in my book. Um, I mean, in my, my chapter, I wish it was a book. Uh, but the irony is that what started as a radical feminist agenda is now a powerful set of norms and instruments integrated across multiple arenas and forms of global, global governance that have made addressing gender violence imperative for a huge range of institutional actors, providing them with names and categories, protocols, procedures, uh, with which to do so. And that's why we developed this unwieldy term, GB Bao, uh, because how else could we represent this power knowledge formation? And the power of GB Bao, we show in the various chapters, uh, comes from locking onto ruling apparatuses and translating itself or insinuating itself into their political rationales and modalities. And I wish Rima Hamami were here because she's one of the you know, big brains behind this way of thinking. But traveling with these various um, governmental bedfellows, GB Val produces these changing reigning objects like honor crimes or sexual slavery and highlights, uh, and the girl, uh, and highlights certain categories of perpetrators and victims while ignoring others. Uh, and so, you know, as I said, we make a distinction between GB Vow as this codified apparatus of global governance and, and gender violence, which is an absolutely necessary feminist political category that speaks to the lived realities of violence and hierarchies in gender relations as these intersect with other forms of oppression. So we wanna open things up. We wanna consider the complex variable context specific range of human experiences of harm from war to racism, state violence and so forth. Uh, and recognizing the variability in the ways gender and violence are experienced in different contexts also we think helps us think about activism. How might situated movements and activists struggling for justice also have different readings um, and priorities of what gender violence might mean or what it might include than those working in metropolitan international institutions. You know, we think about India, we think about all the places, the very context specific uh, politics. So um, the concept of cunning captured for us so much of what our 
diverse case studies revealed how the prevailing assumptions and technologies might be affirming, enabling, or sustaining rationales and systems of power that are actually maybe harmful or at least at odds with the intents of the feminists who push for them. So are they delivering the protection they're meant to? What's the price of inclusion for feminists? Um, just think about the way the kind of highly emotive issue of sexual violence and war has become a major focus of UN conventions, protocols, resources, interventions. Uh, and I think the negative ramifications have been manifold for those seeking redress from violence, gendered or not, and especially for those who seek an end to war and armed conflict altogether, even as the category has been very productive for the opposite in a way for imperial interventions of rescue, whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Syria, for big resource flows, and for lots of employment opportunities for experts, including feminists. So we ended up um, organizing this book in terms of four key circuits of power to which the institutionalized feminist agenda seemed to have attached itself. First, the global security world order, Second, states and state institutions that themselves perpetrate gendered violence, but are punished in international legal institutions only very selectively, usually only if they're failed or barbaric states run by brown or black people and are not allies of Europe and the United States. Uh, third, the civilizational industries. Uh, I think you did use that word describing what um, Dina is working on, uh, that intervene in other parts of the world in the name of humanitarianism or development. And fourth, mass media, uh, whose gatekeeping and representations support these interventions. And Interpol Grewal's chapter actually talks a lot about mass media in India and the West about India. And what we saw, we saw the consistent ways that the apparatus of GB Vow, supported by social and mass media, appears to have made its gains on the backs of racialized others, whether as individuals, minorities, or nation states. So for us, the cunning of gender GB Vow lies in the way that its efforts to foreground certain forms of violence. In doing that, it forecloses a questioning of the very systems that are producing the conditions for so many forms of gendered violence to, and harm to flourish. So how well does the GBVL bow apparatus treat forms of slow structural violence, including legitimate state, legitimate state violence, or even war and militarism, when its efficacy depends on its attachment to existing forms of power that are actually responsible for these big violences or slow violences? Mm. Um, and before turning this over to my uh, dear colleagues, uh, who I've learned so much from, and to show you how some of these dynamics are at work in South Asia, I do want to say that we have wanted to go beyond critique, you know, to ask ourselves, how might we think otherwise? What could we do differently? And although we all began with a concern about gendered violence, small g, we don't presume that gender can be disentangled from race, from class, from indigeneity, from ethnicity, and other historical and contemporary forces and markers of difference. I'm sure you all know this perfectly well, but sometimes it gets forgotten. Uh, and if we understand uh, governance as both biopolitical and necropolitical, as my colleague uh, Nadra Shalhoub always likes to say, uh, we have to think beyond laws, beyond resolutions, and beyond policies. Uh, and I think in this, we share a fundamental ground with traditional traditions of feminist activism uh, and thinking centered in the global South, the third world, whatever you want to call it, that presume feminism is indivisible from broader struggles. Uh, geopolitical inequalities are fundamental feminist concerns. If securitization, militarization, state violence, corporate development, developmentalism, and humanitarianism are recognized as in themselves violent, then we need to look at what GB Vow does and what it doesn't do when it attaches itself to them. 
Uh, and um, as we talked about, I've been most interested in what the push for inclusion or mainstreaming feminism uh, entails, as Janet Halley warns, um, uh, certainly in secure feminism. But uh, Janet Halley put it in a way that I really uh, love, where she says she warns that alignments with power risk five C's, collaboration, compromise, collusion, complicity, and co-optation. And as an anthropologist and someone who studied the politics of representations of the other, uh, as you heard, as in my book, Do Muslim Women Need Saving? I also think, I need to think, um, I think we all, we have to start with the everyday experiences of the subjects of violence. And as our colleague Nadra uh, Shahub Kavorkin always reminds us, the clues to how to think otherwise will come from close listening to those living their historically specific situations of violence, including activists themselves who are living particular situations. Uh, and that's why we were really so honored by this invitation to discuss some of our work with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lila. And may I sort of invite uh, Dina Siddiqui now to speak? Um, thank you. It is a pleasure and honor to be here, particularly because these conversations across regions and borders are don't happen enough, but they're so generative. So it is particularly interesting to be in India, so to speak, while being in the global north. Um, I'm very excited about our hopefully uh, our discussion afterwards. I am going to talk about um, the global development apparatus and how it is implicated in uh, various feminist issues inside Bangladesh. I want to begin by briefly setting out why I chose to problematize the category of child marriage. By the way, my paper is called Bangladesh and Child Marriage and the Feminist Imagination, my chapter in the book. Um, just to clarify my political and intellectual position, and then I want to go on to talk about the emergence of child marriage as a discourse that does very specific ideological work, especially in obscuring the kinds of slow violence that Professor Abu Lubod was just talking about, right? And I want to end perhaps if I have time with some brief thoughts on how to have other conversations we need to have that get covered over when we are talking about these sensationalist categories. Um, let me just time, please feel free to tell me when um, I have, you know, my 10 minutes are over, my 12, 15 minutes are over. Um, I want to make clear at the outset that I'm not arguing for child marriage, however we define it, nor am I suggesting that there's a problem with, um, the empirical issues that we just need to get the numbers right and that there isn't a problem at all. That's not what I'm saying. I have a very different problematic in mind. Um, and Bangladeshi feminists have long mobilized against rape, sexual harassment, dowry related violence, along with very successful campaigns against asset throwing, trafficking and so-called fatwa related, fatwa driven violence, right? The addition of child marriage to this list in the last decade might appear to be unremarkable as yet another patriarchal tradition in, in need of correction or elimination. It is this assumption that child marriage should be an obvious object of feminist state and humanitarian concern today that I want to trouble. Now, historically, child marriage in colonial South Asia has signaled cultural backwardness and was used to consolidate lines of civilizational difference, particularly in Bengal. As you know, the girl child, and as a result, the girl child and her sexual consent uh, featured prominently in nationalist debates on social reform in colonial Bengal in the early 20th century. That discussion, however, revolved primarily around the identity of upper caste Hindu communities. It was very much about the making of a particular Hindu identity. The stakes for Muslim Bengalis were muted and indirect, I would say. 
The irony is that the politically in the politically volatile decade of the 19 decades of the 1920s and 30s, Hindu nationalists actively sought to sever any association of child marriage with Brahmanical norms, seeking to recast it as a specifically Muslim problem originating from the Prophet's marriage to Aisha, as Ishita Bande's recent work shows quite nicely. This historical legacy notwithstanding, if you look at the post-independent period in Bangladesh, it is only in the 2000s that a robust association between child marriage and women's issues emerges in, in the national imaginary, along with corresponding to a global concern with child marriage. In fact, much to my surprise, Bangladesh's child marriage problem suddenly seemed everywhere around 2012, 2013. Um, in all kinds of unexpected places. And I, you know, I have, I was very surprised. I thought I was quite familiar with various human rights issues, having done lots of editing for human rights groups. But in any case, the impulse for this paper then came from realizing that Bangladesh had become a global signifier of the world's child marriage problem. And the tone of many of these stories was alarmist and sensationalist. At the same time as UNFPA sounded the alarm on child marriage globally, the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, included the elimination of child marriage as an indicator of progress, right? It's worth noting here that until these uh, the early 2000s, no major UN declaration on women names child marriage either as an issue of violence against women or as an impediment to development. But in 2014, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution asking all member states to pass and enforce laws banning child marriage. This resolution formalized the global governmentalization of child marriage in the 21st century, right? This is what happens. So why did child marriage surface when it did? And so why is it so tenaciously attached to feminist and development anxieties, particularly to Bangladesh's global image? What are the institutional sites through which this unanticipated category, as I call it, travel? And what does that tell us about what becomes legible, what kinds of violence, violence against women become legible globally and what kinds are hidden away? How do differently positioned Bangladeshi feminists negotiate, recalibrate or refuse this hegemonic, um, the kind of funding pressures and agenda setting that comes with global uh, valorization of something, not valorization, but the attention on something like this thing, the practice called child marriage. These are some of the issues I um, address in the longer version of my paper, which I am trying to um, sum up and summing up in 15 minutes is very hard. Um, I argue now on the one hand, um, Shanila Kotamulji has actually written a lot on girls empowerment and education and what um, the kinds of anxiety that a child marriage discourse does in particular places. And true, and um, in the same way in Bangladesh, cultural anxieties over female adolescent sexuality, especially in relation to the development imp imperative to bring women, impoverished women and girls into out into the labor market are often articulated or contested through child marriage deb debates. These narratives often also rely on stock perpetrators, among whom patriarchal fathers, cruel husbands, conniving imams, or corrupt government officials, all bad Muslim males, as Shanila points out, figure prominently. And in the prevailing discursive Bangladesh, uh, environment in Bangladesh, you don't actually have to reference Islam. It's there without being named, at least in Bangladesh. My argument is that the panic around child marriage has done less visible but equally critical ideological work, helping to smooth over contradictions around discourses of girls' empowerment and poverty reduction. And here, following Professor Abu Lugod, we might ask, 
what are Bangladeshi girls being saved to once they are saved from child marriage? Quite likely their aspirations center on employment in one of the several million apparel export factories that dot the urban landscape of Taka and Chittagong and other places. Therein lies the cunning of this form of governmentality, I would say. Once the category of child marriage is deployed and understood as barbaric practice and violent cultural norm that stands in the way of girls' empowerment and national development, it works to obscure the actual capitalist violence awaiting those who labor in factories, right? Factories become empowerment and freedom. Not that, and I'm not arguing against jobs for young women either here, but images of girls at risk from tradition and racialized predatory men invisibilize the structural causes of poverty and inequality. In effect, um, it shifts the source and site of scandal from the neoliberal state and the hyper-extractive financialized global order in which it is nested to the realm of culture and norms foreclosing critical lines of interrogation. Now, uh, the historian of science, Michelle Murphy, who's done a lot of research on Bangladesh, traces the roots of this shift from um, this focus on the girls, a shift of the figuration of development narratives from women to girls um, to um, a, a particular time in the World Bank begins to promote something called smart economics, right? In her account, older notions of human capital were discursively repurposed so that embodiment itself became a site of financial investment. In this new calculus, third world bodies that once possessed negative or low value were potentially improvable and investable. If they were provided with the right conditions, they could produce higher rates of return than before. It is at this juncture that the figure of the third world girl and her possible futures, and by extension, the national and global economic futures come into sharpened focus in the early 2020s. And she has lots of stuff on Davos and whatever else. She has some really great quotes. But in Murphy's words, the figure of the third world girl, typically represented as South Asian or African, often Muslim, has become the iconic vessel of human capital. Thoroughly heterosexualized, her rates of return are dependent on her forecasted compliance with certain expectations, serve the family, adhere to heterosexual propriety, study hard. She's got to be girled, but she has to, it's very interesting that she has to not get pregnant, not run off with boys, not drop out of school. You know, only then can she have value. Otherwise, she becomes disposable like all these other women before her. And Murphy traces much of this to the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. I would argue then that far from being another overlooked tradition, child marriage surfaces or perhaps resurfaces as an object of concern at a critical global conjuncture, conjuncture one that corresponds to the financialization of development. Right. And so child marriage basically threatens to undermine the speculative future value of the girl in that sense. Um, two discursive shifts are evident around this time. One is the trend toward collapsing the categories of early forced and child marriage. Now, there's a prolific literature on development in Bangladesh, and you can really see in 2008, even the World Bank was talking about early marriage. Increasingly, by 2018, another World Bank report talks about a white quote, a widely perceived intractable problem of child marriage that is culturally entrenched and immutable. In the intervening years, there's just been a veritable cottage industry on around child marriage. And I there's some of it is actually quite reasonable, actually actual analysis. But then you also have sensationalist coverage, for instance, in foreign policy magazine, um, there was a headline in 2019 that said Bangladesh's child marriage problem is the world's 
trafficking crisis. And it's really interesting to see how the global and um, national are um, tied in, intertangled here. So the second trend is that the classification of child marriage goes from being just a practice to be, being named as a form of gender-based violence against women or as a harmful cultural practice. And um, on par with often you'll see in UN women websites and other websites, it's it sits side by side with female genital cutting. And as the anthropologist Sally Mary noted, in her ethnography of CEDAW procedures, genital cutting is the poster child and prototype of this idea of harmful cultural practice. So it conjures up particular cultural horror. So you might wonder about the numbers. According to the UN Women site, the child marriage prevalence rate in Bangladesh is 59% or 58.6%. This 59% figure, or it was, uh, you know, in 2019, and actually I think the figure has gone down and it's currently plateaued. This 59% figure has been extraordinarily gener generative. It's taken on almost a mythic quality so that people just throw it around in the media, in policy circles. If you take a closer look of, about how, at the, how the data is organized, it's organized by age cohorts actually. And there's a big division, um, distinction between girls under 15 and girls, you know, and between and girls under 18. So it is true that 22, as of March 2019, 22% of those who were 20 to 24 years had been married by the age of 15, right? It follows that the remaining population of girls were married when they were 16 or 17. So here we have to ask, what is glossed over in classifying all marriages under 18 as child marriages? What kind of violence is entailed when the distinction between a 12 or enabled, when the distinction between a 12 year old who might well be really forced into a marriage versus a 17 year old who may have, who may feel she is very clear about her intention and her desire. When that distinction is obliterated, what happens? These are not questions that can be asked within the current framing of the child marriage problem, which basically has, you know, there's a magic number 18, after which you can have agency before then you don't, right? Um, it produces subjects who are only ever victims, terrorized by culture or patriarchy or religion, whatever you want to call it. So um, the resulting homogenized re readings basically flatten complex social conditions, but they also then flatten the forms of redress available. The figuration of the child produces a sense of urgency that privileges certain kinds of interventions over others. So despite the widespread recognition that it's poverty and insecurity that are two core factors underlying early marriage, and of course, a child marriage went up very much during the pandemic, it's not no surprise. Once the practice is understood as an intractable cultural norm in need of ideological correction only, measures such as community awareness building or individual legal training present themselves as the most obvious and effective interventions. In this discursive environment, the otherwise glaring absence of structural interventions is barely notable. Uh, noticeable. Empirical evidence actually constantly disrupts this global narrative. It's a narrative that's embedded in the SDGs, for instance. The SDG says there are sexually innocent children forced to leave school for untimely marriage. Yes and no, I wouldn't completely, you know, uh, say that's not true, but as uh, research from India has recently shown, um, in the face of societal and state neglect, many girls exert control and agency through developing romantic relationships, which can lead to marriage at a young age. My own research indicates that girls who lack alternatives to socially sanctioned non-marital sex often elope or claim to be married to their sexual partners. Um, and usually these are girls between that age of 16 and 18. Um. 
what, there's a contradiction that happens if these girls are treated in the same way as 12 year olds. The, this, and it places progressive Bangladeshi feminists in a double mind. The sexually active adolescent actually really disrupts this script of innocence on which people on the ground have come to rely in their struggle against early marriage. It is really a complication. Um, I'm going to wrap up by just saying um, the discussion of adolescent sexual subjectivity and desire, uh, desire is foreclosed by a singular focus on age. At the same time, the will to improve or civilize through the bodies of women is very much part of the project of development. And child marriage is just the latest category that draws on and reproduces this older civilizational framework. Certain questions then simply cannot be asked. Most obviously, of course, a reductive focus on child marriage displaces structural and historical and political analysis in favor of eliminating backward kinship and cultural expectations, okay? Um, and feminist and other imaginations and actions are then also necessarily disciplined, right? When you when histories of impoverishment, climate catastrophe, dispossession, extraction, all of those remain out of the frame of action. Certain forms of violence of the kind regularly faced by young female Bangladeshi garment factory workers, for instance, fade into the backdrop so that laboring itself can be framed as liberatory. So here I, I want to end by saying that the affective power of the child marriage narrative, there's no direct relationship, but it underlines, underwrites and naturalizes export led development as social progress and as women's empowerment, foreclosing imagining how and what the good life can be. And I think it's also at the place of imagination that we need to take back and rethink the narrative and reframe ways reframe our thinking in ways that actually serve the girls and the adolescents, you know, the child marriage discourse says it's meant to protect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Siddiqui. And, uh, you know, I won't even try to summarize. We've had these two wonderful presentations. So we'll get, go back and flag off later after, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Shanila makes a presentation to the key themes that have been put forward. So uh, Dr. Shanila, you're there? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah. It is a delight to be here uh, amongst all of you and to discuss some of these topics um, with the audience. Um, I will use the time that I have to um, try to summarize um, the chapter um, that is going to appear in this wonderful book. And I do um, hope that you get to read the book because each of the chapters tries to do this sort of deconstruction and the opening um, that Professor Abulagot spoke about. And so it's a diverse sort of, it spans the geographical um, spans as well. Um, and so um, in my chapter, I contemplate the politics of human rights in Pakistan, particularly as it relates to legislating honor crimes. I draw on the 2016 killing of Kandil Baloch, a social media celebrity, as a trampoline to both acknowledge how the frame of honor killing and the language of rights in general um, has created a space for activists in Pakistan to coerce the state into instituting important measures to protect women and to argue how these frames reiterate the state as a purveyor of women's rights, effectively masking its own complicity in creating the very conditions um, that produce women's subordination. And so I'm sitting at this sort of paradox um, and I want to highlight the work of um, activists who are also sitting at the paradox, but then conclude with actually showing some of the other strategies that Pakistani feminist activists have um, taken upon as well. Um, so on July 15, 2016, Kandil Baloch, a social media celebrity known for her sexually provocative videos, was strangled to death by her brother, Raseem. He gave her a sleeping pill and then choked her to death with the help of two accomplices. Speaking later at a press conference, Vasim explained that he killed her because she was bringing dishonor to his family. The news of this incident spread like wildfire in Pakistan, making Kandil a household name. 
In life, Kandil had been a minor celebrity, if that, but the manner of her murder catapulted her into this global fame. fame. She was instantly framed as yet another victim of honor killing, a quote, scourge in most Muslim countries and carried out with impunity in Pakistan. That's the headline in a Pakistani newspaper. So Kandil's murder became a rallying cry for women's rights activists in Pakistan. And within a few months, enough pressure was put on the state to pass an amendment that had been stalled for years. This amendment included harsher punishments for those who committed honor crimes and partially closed a loophole whereby family members of victims could forgive the perpetrator of the crime. The successful mobilization of civil society in the aftermath of Kandil's killing signaled not only the widespread disapproval of honor-based crimes in Pakistan, but also an ever-increasing deployment of and affinity with the language of rights as the key vocabulary for human dignity, freedom, and equality. And so I'll briefly share some of the specifics around this mobilization. While women in Pakistan have been agitating against gender-based violence for decades, in recent years, mobilization around honor killings has gained momentum. Asad Jamal, a lawyer who fought on behalf of a rare survival, survivor of such an attempted murder said, quote, if a brother murders his sister or a father murders his daughter, the first possible reason would be honor, unquote. So Kandil's murder fit these frames neatly and was instantly termed as an honor killing and interpreted as a violation of her rights to live as she pleased. What troubled activists was that such cases are often tried under the Kisas and Diyat ordinance, which permits the assaulted person or her family to either punish the perpetrator in a like manner or demand monetary compensation. But oftentimes, perpetrators of honor killings, who are by definition frequently member family members, they are forgiven by the family members of the victim. So the ordinance transforms a woman's murder, when linked to honor, from a crime against the state to a crime against the person. And activists have therefore been calling for addressing this loophole for decades, particularly through amendments. So amendments are a particular and a popular activist strategy for dealing within liberal democracies. They allow activists to build on the infrastructure that is already available. While opportunistic, such strategies are often um, most immediate ways to access relief. Yet, since activists work within the frameworks of liberal democracy, substantial redress can remain elusive. Nonetheless, in 2014, Senator Sukhara Imam introduced a criminal's laws amendment, which called for increasing the penalty for offenses committed in the name of or in the pretext of honor. It also gave the courts authority to reject compromises made by the victim's family. Specifically, it stipulated that the family could not pardon the perpetrator. This bill passed through the Senate in 2015, but it stalled in the parliament later that year. But momentum for the bill increased in 2014 when a documentary by Obeid Chinoy, it featured a survival of a, an honor killing, was nominated and later won an Oscar. Obeid Chinoy also started a petition to gather signatures in order to convince the then prime minister, Nawaz Sharif, about the will of the people. She circulated the messages through newspapers, television, radio, social media. And so Sharif eventually relented and, and he invited her um, to meet him, and then he publicly announced support for her activism. He said, quote, customs and practices such as honor killings have nothing to do with the divine principles and theories of Islam. It was Islam which first recognized the rights of women. Women are the most essential part of our society, and I believe in their empowerment, protection, and emancipation, unquote. In these remarks, Sharif skillfully erases the state's longstanding culpability in sanctioning violence against women through these legal loopholes, which too are interpretive moves made by the judges to bring the law into alignment with the scripture. In fact, it was during Sharif's tenure in 1997 that the Kisas and Dias ordinance passed in the parliament. Instead, here he conceals these interpretive moves that his government made to write such laws. In doing so, Sharif continues to grant the state the moral authority over women's lives and debts. It is precisely this authority that Kandil undermined, and in the chapter I provide a lot of detail about this, 
but she used to mock politicians for being corrupt. She used to call out the hypocrisy of religious elites, et cetera. And so she was actually pointing out some of these paradoxes um, through her entertainment as well. So Sharif ultimately committed to closing the loophole. Um, and just as these negotiations were taking place, Kandil Baloch was, Baloch was murdered. And so her murder gave further uh, momentum to the activist struggles. And within a few months, this uh, amendment passed the parliament. Sharif, however, then emerged from this episode as this benevolent patriarch and an advocate for women's rights. Blame instead was shifted onto those backward others who engage in inappropriate interpretations of Islam, right? And so you're concealing the work of the state in here. To avoid making honor crimes a simple villain for feminists, as Professor Abu Logod has argued, it is important to pay attention to the specificities of the violence under considerations, as well as the political and social conditions in which violence against women is occurring. And with that in mind, in the chapter, I go on to tell a different story about Kandil. I examine her own media performances, as well as media narratives about her, to provide a thick description of the circumstances that led to her killing. This story turns out to be less about her family and their honor, and more about her politicized contestations, the mocking that she did publicly of state and religious elites, and her naming of male lust as an organizing principle in Pakistani society. Her critiques threatened specific national elites and were inflamed by local media. Paying attention to these logics undermines any easy reduction of her murder to the seductive category of honor killings, as Professor Abu Lugas has called this category. And it instead shows the complex and entwined local hegemonies, in addition to those of the family, that too were at play in this murder. And so I don't have enough time to go into these details, but I hope that you will read the chapter in the book. Um, but I do want to highlight another form of activism that has emerged around Kandil to point out that there exists a diversity of activist tactics in Pakistan. And so we learned about how some Pakistani activists are drawing on these categories and trying to work with the state to, um, to close these loopholes. And so they're, they're working within the legal realm using the activist device of amendment that's really popular within liber liberal democracy for activists. But here I want to shift our attention to other modes of activism too. So in particular, during the last few years, multiple groups have taken to the streets to reject surveillance and control of women in intimate as well as public spaces. Kandil, for example, is mobilized as a feminist icon during the annual Aurat March, which is held in several cities of Pakistan to commemorate International Women's Day. Um, let me share some images from these marches. So first launched in 2018 through the collaborative effort of a number of feminist collectives, the demonstrators used the march to demand economic, reproductive, and environmental justice for Pakistani women. On this slide, you see how Kandil's likeness is used in the face of a in the in the form of a mask, um, and protesters are advancing their own demands. Here you see another poster also from um, the Orad March, and here she's um, basically in the. Um, in her sunglasses, you can say that, okay, a lot of you hate me, but I don't actually give a damn. And so this is another kind of articulation and uh, a, a subject position that Kandil is making possible for Pakistani feminists. This 2020 tweet from the organizers of the Karachi arm of the march signals how Kandil is reanimated to destabilize statist, religious, and familiar, con familial control. In particular, you will notice how blame is not solely placed on the brother, but the legal system and the religious official, the specific one that she exposed through her, um, through her political sort of work. And so I'll read only a part of this tweet. Um, so it says, Kandil is why we march. Forced in a marriage she didn't want, she left Multan to seek stardom and fought her way to Pakistan Idol, where she was ridiculed and humiliated but the underdog with unheard of social media savvy soon built an audience on Facebook where she was admired and vilified in equal measure. And for that, she was murdered by her own brother. Or was it just him? Who truly killed Kandil? Honor crime is a crime that shares bloody hands from individual participants who watched Kandil's provocative videos on one screen, 
and spewed venom against her on the other even after her death to the media that is unheeding of the danger they place women in when they leak her information on national TV, to the family members whose hands did the deed, all the way to the legal systems that delayed and denied her justice. The patriarchy works in silent, in, to silence those who do not comply with the system. And so when Kandil took a step too far and exposed the morals of a man considered a religious um, gatekeeper, she was brutally murdered. Another feminist public, uh, public is visible in the work of Girls Ed Thaba, uh, a collective that directs attention to women's gradual disappearance from the Pakistani public space and looks to redefine public spaces for them. Members of the group often claim space by visiting tabas, which are street sites, tea stalls, um, and they are patronized predominantly by men. They post their photos on Instagram and Twitter, occupying space both materially and digitally. While no longer active, the group has engaged in several campaigns, including hosting rallies that encourage girls to bike. It also sponsored a public mural in Karachi featuring Kandil. In the mural, Kandil stands tall atop another image that features the hands of multiple women signifying Behenchara or sisterhood. So I conclude with these images in order to signal the diversity of feminist activism in Pakistan. Such groups draw on the category of honor crime, but move beyond it to name the multiple intersecting forces that shape women's lives. These activists assert their right to assembly through protest, and in doing so, become the very bodies in public that make the state and religious elites nervous in the first place. They draw on social media currency to build solidarity, and instead of seeking inclusion in a state that relies on exploitation of sexual labor, carve out new domains of feminist politics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shalila.